So we are glad to have with us uh, today, Dr. Antonio Chocaros. Let me first uh, present him briefly, since it's the first time he gives a talk in our seminars. He's a research scientist at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign at the Department of Physics at the US. Um, he got uh, his uh, a PhD uh, at uh, the University of Wisconsin, at, uh, uh, again at the, the US. Uh, while his uh, first degree is in electrical engineering in uh, the University of Thessaloniki. Uh, he has a, a series of uh, postdoc positions starting at the University of the Aegean, where he has been lecturer uh, for a long period. And then uh, he went to the Max Planck Institute uh, uh, for Gravitational Physics at uh, Potsdam. And then uh, again in Germany, another position at the Johann Wolfgang Goethe Universität, uh, the Institute of Theoretical Physics. And uh, since uh, 2016, he's at uh, the University of Illinois. Uh, his uh, research interests are in general relativity, numerical relativity as well, relativistic astrophysics, magnetohydrodynamics, alternative uh, theories of gravity, F2R, et cetera, cosmology and dynamical systems. You already have been informed about the title of the talk, which you already see on your screen, numerical general relativity and astrophysics in the era of multi-messenger astronomy. And we are very glad to, to listen to your talk. Please go on. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as you can see in uh, the title, uh, today I'm going to talk about numerical general relativity and astrophysics, uh, especially uh, in the context of uh, the discoveries that happened after 2015, where uh, the first gravitational wave has been um, detected. <clears throat> so uh, the... Uh, the study uh, that uh, we are interested in is the, essentially the physics of compact objects. So I'm going to talk about the astrophysics at the end of the day of single and binary systems. Um, um, this is a big uh, um, field that involves, uh, for example, rotating neutron stars, magnet stars, uh, or even more exotic stars like quark stars, binaries of every kind like binary black holes, uh, uh, neutron stars and uh, etc as well as post merger objects like black hole disks and so on and so on so as you can imagine there is a, a wealth of topics here uh, and inevitably i'm only going to touch uh, on a small portion of them uh, <clears throat> so my talk uh, is going to have two parts um, the first part is going to uh, give you a background and the context of uh, our work, and especially for people who are not familiar with this field, uh, it will give you an understanding of what we are really doing. Um, the second part is going to be uh, geared towards relativistic astrophysics and various applications for uh, a number of projects that we have uh, been working uh, the past uh, many years. Uh, <clears throat> So let's start with the first part, which is the initial value problem in general relativity. Uh, and let me try to uh, give you a short and compact introduction of uh, uh, what is uh, really all about. For those who are um, uh, familiar with the field, uh, I hope they can uh, find something new in this introduction. Um, so uh, the starting point, uh, our starting point is the Einstein field equations. and. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, of course, with the few idealized problems, one has to resort to uh, uh, numerical solutions in order to describe uh, the various realistic physical systems that he wants to study. Um, <clears throat> now, all these systems uh, are being described by the same equations, um, but uh, unfortunately, every system needs different techniques in order to be uh, resolved. Uh, 
Um, and I want to a little bit uh, uh, delve into this problem. So for example, on the right hand side, you see a binary neutron star, which is on, on a circular orbit and is ready to merge. On the left hand side, you see maybe a black hole disk or a, a rotating neutron star. <clears throat> uh, uh, and these seem to be completely different uh, uh, systems. And we have to find a way to um, to to deal with uh, both of them uh, through the same set of equations, which are the Einstein field equations. <clears throat> so the question that I want to uh, to ask here uh, and have us uh, thought for a little bit is what are the quantities that describe a highly relativistic physical system at a given moment. Um, we need to address this question if we want to do any kind of study where we want to see the evolution of such kind of a system. Uh, <clears throat> for example, uh, you have a particle that you move in a specific direction. So you have, uh, for example, its initial position and its initial velocity, and then you um, track that velocity and position over time. So what? So, the, so this is exactly the same question here. You have a binary neutron star, or you have a black hole with a disk, uh, a material around it, and the question is, what are the quantities that characterize uh, those two uh, seemingly different uh, uh, systems? <clears throat> and for example, can we guess those quantities, or do we have to compute them? In order to answer that and to put uh, you know, the whole discussion into um, uh, uh, a historical context, I'm going to make a digression and I'm going to talk about the geometrical problem that lies in the heart of this question, which is essentially the identification of manifolds uh, of different uh, dimensions. For example, I will go back to the 18th century and we, uh, we know from the elementary classes uh, of differential geometry that if you have a curve, uh, you can construct a Fresnel triadon on every point, and you can take the derivatives of uh, the three vectors along, those, along that curve and write this system, which includes two scalar quantities. Um, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my cursor, that would be very helpful. Uh, the, the scalar um, quantity kappa, which is called the curvature, and the scalar quantity uh, tau, which is called the torsion. And there is the fundamental theorem that says that if you give me these two scalar quantities, I can reconstruct the curve. Um, and every other curve that has the same quantities differs by that one by um, a rigid motion. Um, so this is uh, the, the, the first step towards what we are trying to understand. The second step happened in the 19th century with the equations of uh, Gauss and Weingart. And this is very useful because uh, the two-dimensional problem, although it seems very uh, remote, is very close to the relativistic problem that we try to, uh, to address. So uh, similarly with the one-dimensional problem, we have uh, a... Uh, uh, basis of three vectors, the two tangent vectors and the normal vector, and we take derivatives of those vectors and we set up this system of equations. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that with this system, we have an extra set of equations, which are called the compatibility equations, which are coming from the equations of uh, uh, mixed derivatives that I am writing down there. They are also called the constraint equations, and they are nothing less than um, the uh, Gauss and the Kodachi main the constraint equations. And then we have the um, famous Bonnet theorem that says that if you give me um, the, um, the uh, metric on this two-dimensional surface and also the extrinsic curvature K uh, that exists in these equations, um, uh, I can... Uh, uh, I can find out what is the surface and uh, uh, provided, of course, that those quantities satisfy the constraint equations and any other surface um, uh, is going to be related to that one with, uh, uh, through an isometry. Um, and now, the, K, the Kij, which is called also the extrinsic curvature, um, uh, essentially tells us how this two-dimensional surface is embedded into the, uh, the three-dimensional space and it gives the information about the curvature of the normal section. The normal section is this plane here with the cyan curve. 
And the curvature of the cyan curve here on the surface is given by this line, in this radius here that is, is being cut at this point. Uh, <clears throat> so if you can imagine that instead of this two-dimensional surface, you have a three-dimensional surface, which is embedded into a higher dimensional space-time, you have this picture here. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, essentially, you arrive on uh, uh, the initial value problem of general relativity. I'm going to uh, uh, say some more details uh, in the next slide, um, but <clears throat> I, want to, I want to say here that the first attempt to understand those equations has been done by Hilbert in the 1920s, although uh, that was not uh, a very successful attempt, I would say. Uh, the first successful uh, understanding was by George Damois in 1929, his student at ne Andrei Liknevovich in 1939, uh, uh, and all these works culminated with the uh, uh, theorem by Madame Choquet-Bourois in 1952 about the local existence and uniqueness of the Einstein field equations and its maximal solution in 1969 in collaboration with Robert Gerrard. So <laughs> given the fact that um, uh, 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 Sh Madame Shokebois was a student of Liknevovich and he was a student of Darwin, it's not an exaggeration to say that the initial value problem in general relativity was a French business. Uh, <clears throat> uh, also, I want, I want to say another thing is that uh, um, this embedding, that uh, theorem that we have just discussed in physics, uh, there, are, there is a big literature also in the mathematics with the celebrated theorems of, by John Nash about the embedding of Riemannian manifolds into higher dimensional spaces. So there is a big literature and it's by no means a trivial matter. Now I want to focus on a little bit uh, on, the, uh, on the plot here on the bottom right. And in order to be a little bit more concrete and go back into the relativity, so here again, I have the two slices, which are three dimensional. That's why we call them hypersurfaces. And we have two extra functions. One function that tells us how to move from one slice to another, which is called the lapse function. And another function, which is called the, uh, which is called the shift vector, that tells us how coordinates move within a specific slice. So if you apply the uh, Pythagorean theorem with the Lorentzian analog on the red triangle here, you will end up with this line element that I have here on the top that is characterized by the lapse, the shift, and the metric. Gamma ij is the Riemannian metric on the three-dimensional slice. And then uh, uh, having, uh, uh, having written all this, you can rewrite the whole system of the Einstein equation as an initial value problem with respect to the gamma ages and the k ages, as you can see on the bottom here. Um, so this is the dynamical system that we are trying to, to solve. And we have similar to, to the two dimensional case, we have the constraint or compatibility equations, which are another four equations. <clears throat> Uh, from this dynamical system, uh, it's obvious that the initial functions that we want to, uh, to have are the metric gamma ij and the extrinsic curvature kij. So going back to the question that I asked in the beginning, uh, 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 we have just answered it. And now the question is, can I guess those values so that I can plug them back into this system here? Um, and, and evolve it? Well, the answer is no. People have tried to do that for uh, many decades, since the 60s, and um, because the equations of are highly non-leader, there is no way one can guess those quantities and just start um, an evolution, uh, which means that we have to compute them. <clears throat> so how do we compute them? We, well, we have to go back again to the system and, and try to make some reasonable assumptions about the time derivatives that appear there. Um, for example, if you have a, a rotating star, which is a stable equilibrium, you, you expect that the time derivatives are going to be zero. Um, <clears throat> so if you do that, you will get a, a set of elliptic equations. Um, uh, that one can solve to for the gamma ijs and the k ijs. Now, there is a significant amount of literature in this field, 
um, and uh, we can talk for many hours how to do that for every single system that I'm writing here, like a single rotating star, a binary neutron star, a binary black hole. Every system will have um, uh, some different kind of assumptions and methodologies. For example, if you have a binary system, you cannot take the time derivatives to be zero because the binary is moving, but you can assume some kind of a helical symmetry that uh, since the binary is moving along a helix, and you can assume that the time along that helical vector can be zero. Uh, <clears throat> in any case, I want to, the, uh, to, to mention here probably the most common uh, and most important decomposition, which is this conformal decomposition, which was introduced by Lignerovitz, um, uh, going from the initial metric to a conformal metric, gamma tilde ij. Uh, and the reason that that was proven to be very useful was that one of the constraint equations, which is this equation here, um, could be easily decoupled and provide a simple elliptic equation for the conformal factor. And then you have to deal with the rest of the equations and so on and so on. Uh, <laughs> so, are we done with uh, with uh, with the problem of the initial data? Well, not yet, because we have the stress and tensor. And on top of that, we uh, have, uh, if we don't have a binary black hole, we have Euler equations, we may have the Maxwell equations, and we can have radiation transport, we can have a lot of things, and uh, um, uh, a lot of things get into the stress energy tension. So the question is, do we solve all these systems self-consistently, uh, or do we solve some of it uh, self-consistently, and I'm, I'm going to explain what I mean later, um, and some of the equations, we, we just assume some ad hoc values. Um, the, <clears throat> the bottom line is that the self-consistent solution of the full set of equations um, is very difficult. And although there, there are a lot of uh, progress that have been done over the past 25 years, um, uh, still we do not have the final answer. <clears throat> uh, so uh, for people who are interested into uh, this this kind of understanding, I will point and make a short advertisement here of a short review article that we have written and is going to be published soon uh, the past year regarding binary neutron stars, black hole disks, and magnetized rotating neutron stars. Um, now, <laughs> I have told you about the mathematical uh, background, but uh, that is only half of the story because uh, you have to solve these equations. And in order to solve these equations, you need some kind of, uh, let's say, calculators. And there are two kinds of equations, as you can understand. There is the, the one that solves the elliptic problem. Um, uh, and uh, our, our group is using the compact object calculator code uh, or COCAL. Um, and the other is to do the uh, evolution of the full four-dimensional uh, hyperbolic problem, which in that case, we are using the Illinois GRMHD code. Now, the development of these codes is a big, is a very big business. And uh, in this single transparency, um, a lot of things have been removed, as you can imagine. Um, uh, there are approximately more than two dozen of uh, scientists that have contributed into the development of these codes that have taken more than 15 years. Uh, and they, they, they uh, span to thousands of, uh, of uh, hundreds of lines. Um, the, the elliptic solver is based on the Komatsu Riguchi Hasisu scheme, and uh, I, I should say that, and it's a finite difference code. And um, uh, the hyperbolic solver is based on the Bongarte Shapiro Shibata Nakamura scheme, and of course, it's a, a, a finite difference scheme. Uh, so I'm not going to talk more about the tools that we are using, but essentially, this is the uh, main idea from the uh, from part one, and I, I'll move into now what we are mostly interested, um, uh, which is the astrophysics um, for various systems. And I'm going to start uh, the presentation of this uh, gallery by, of solutions by starting from self-gravitating tilted black hole disk solutions. 
Um, so uh, typically when you have uh, some gaseous environment around the black hole, the black hole is much, uh, has a mass which is much bigger than the mass of the, of the disk. And therefore, one um, uh, assumes that it, he has the care solution and outside he has some fluid flow around the care solution. Um, now, this is not always the case. And there is a possibility that the, the fluid that exists around the, the black hole is, has a significant mass, which means that it can uh, uh, change the space-time itself. And therefore, the space-time is not the care, uh, uh, the care space-time. Uh, now, what is that space-time? Of course, you have to solve it through numerical relativity. <clears throat> um, and uh, for uh, although uh, previous works actually uh, from the beginning of 90s, uh, they have uh, been computing self-gravitating disks. Uh, all those works have been uh, used the spin of the, of the black hole to be aligned with the angular momentum of the disk. Um, uh, there has been no work that has been done on tilted systems. And on 2019, we devised uh, for the first time a method um, to solve for this kind of systems. And actually, we went one step ahead. And not only we provided the initial data, but we solved the full Einstein system, but not the full hydrodynamical system, I would say here. And in particular, we solved for all the, uh, the uh, variables that you see uh, with circles there and, and uh, the conformal geometry itself, which was the main problem. Uh, <clears throat> uh, to do that, we have employed a different decomposition of, of the extrinsic curvature and we used horizon penetrated coordinates, which are well adapted for the evolution. Uh, in this way, we could construct sequences of self gravitating disks similar to sequences of rotating neutron stars and uh, the uh, in the uh, example that you see in the pictures, uh, I have a disk, which is the last member of a sequence that has a mass five times the mass of the black hole, uh, whose, whose dimensional spin, as you can see here, is almost maximal, is 0 0.99 and something. Um, now, you can appreciate how much the space-time is different from the curve space-time from the, from the right plot, where I'm plotting the conformal factor for the curve shield uh, uh, metric and for the numerical metric, uh, the numerical metric is with solid lines, the dashed lines is with the care shield metric. Um, so <clears throat> um, now uh, disks, uh, regardless if they are self gravitating or not, are subject to various instabilities. Uh, one such non axisymmetric instability is the Papa Luis Operindo instability, who has been. Uh, developed uh, uh, and recognized back in uh, in the 80s, and um, uh, and is driven by uh, interactions from the inner and outer boundary of the disk, um, and uh, 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 the initial assumption uh, that has been done those days using perturbation theory was that the disk has a, a, a constant specific angular momentum distribution. Um, now, we have investigated this instability with self gravitating disks with the group of uh, uh, Vasilios Pascalidis in Arizona University. Um, and now we are moving to do the same kind of analysis where the black hole spin is tilted with respect to the angular momentum of the disk, as it can be shown on the picture on the left. Uh, here you can see the disk that, uh, that has 20% um, of the mass of the black hole. And the speed of the black hole is at 45 degrees with respect to the angular momentum of the disk, which you can imagine is along the perpendicular Z axis. On the right uh, plot, you can see at the end of our simulation uh, uh, how the disk has been essentially tilted and uh, also the precession that happened for the black hole. The spin of the black hole now is almost aligned with the z-axis. You can see it uh, uh, much better in this uh, transparency here. On the bottom right, excuse me, on the bottom left, you can see the initial spin at 45 degrees with respect to the z-axis, the, the and then as it moves uh, uh, towards the z-axis uh, uh, along the evolution. So the time here is with respect to the period of, of the maximum density of the disk. On the, bot, on the top panel, you can see the disk, uh, uh, a, cut, a cut through section of the disk 
uh, as it is tilted uh, and the spin of the black hole, while on the right top, you can see a zoom in version with the, the two arms of accretion that are happening um, together with the modes, the M equals one and M equal two modes that uh, exist on the bottom right. The second, uh, uh, the second topic that I want to uh, to, to discuss is is a perennial topic and uh, important nowadays. Again, once again, um, and it has to do with the Newton star maximum mass and the event of GW seventeen or eight seventeen that happened uh, uh, five years now ago. Uh, <clears throat> so, in order to uh, to explain uh, here, um, uh, I want us to focus. And, and to explain the terminology, uh, for those who are not familiar, I want to focus on the three solid curves in this diagram, the blue, the, the red, and the green one, um, uh, as well as the three numbers that exist on the y-axis, uh, which signify the maximum of those three curves. Uh, and I'm going to explain uh, in a little bit what do they signify and why they are important for the analysis of GW170817. <clears throat> the, the blue curve uh, represents solutions uh, of isolated spherical stars, non-rotating. They are solutions of the uh, simple dynamical system of the tolman oppenheimer volkov equations. Uh, <clears throat> the maximum of that uh, uh, mass of, for that, uh, from that curve is denoted by M max spherical, as you can see here. Now, <clears throat> above that curve, you cannot have for a specific equation of state, you, can, you cannot have non-rotating uh, neutron stars, but you can have rotating neutron stars. And actually, you can have a rotating neutron stars all the way to the red curve, um, which signifies the limit of uniformly rotating neutron stars. Uh, the, you cannot find a uniformly rotating neutron star above the red curve. So that's why, because you have mass etiquettes, um, that's why we call that curve the Kepler limit. <clears throat> And the maximum of that curve is going to be denoted by M max soup. The reason that we call it soup is because the, uh, the, the models between the M max spherical and the maximum of the Kepler curve are called supermassive. This is a notation that has been uh, invented by uh, uh, Shapiro, Tekovsky, and so on back in the 90s, 1922 uh, through the works of Coop. Uh, then above the red curve, um, you can have also uh, neutron stars, but they are not uniformly rotating. They must be differentially rotating. <clears throat> and uh, these are called hypermassive neutron stars, another term that has been invented by the Shapiro group and uh, together with Baumgarten and Shibata back in the 2000s. Um, now, there is the following scenario. When you have a binary, uh, when this binary is very heavy and when the two stars touch, they immediately collapse into a black hole. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> this is the prompt collapse curve that you can see here. Um, above the green curve, we call the neutron stars uh, heavy hypermassive, while the, the neutron stars between the uh, M max soup and the, and the M threshold here, we call them light hypermassive. <clears throat> uh, uh, so the maximum spherical mass, the M max spherical, characterizes the equation of state. So it's a very important number, um, which nobody knows exactly right now how much it is. Uh, the M max soup, which is the maximum uh, uniformly rotating uh, stars, are approximately 20% larger than the maximum spherical mass. Uh, but again, it depends on the equation of state. And the threshold mass here is, a, is again, uh, like 1.4 times the maximum spherical mass, which again depends on the equation of state. So the question is, what happened with the, with the neutron stars in event GW170817? And uh, I will claim that our scenario is that the remnant neutron star, before it collapses to a black hole, uh, belonged into this range of masses between M max soup and M threshold. And I will explain why. So we have performed uh, GRMHD simulations for every kind of, uh, of, for different equations of state and for every kind of uh, masses uh, that you can imagine in this, in this kind of classification. 
Um, so the first column here is the is a time evolution of a supermassive case. The second column is a, 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 the evolution of a light hypermassive case, and the and the last column is is an evolution of the heavy hypermassive case. Uh, now, initially, we thread the, the, the neutron stars with the magnetic field, which is dynamically unimportant uh, with, and extends all the way to infinity, as you can see here on the first row. And then we let the system to evolve. Um, what we see is for the supermassive case, when essentially we have small masses, we end up with a neutron star that after a long period of time, it creates a collimation. By the way, uh, in this color bars here, uh, what is being plotted is the magnetic field squared over eight pi rho. So this is B squared, so it is a force-free parameter. Um, so you have a neutron star with an outflow and a significant collimation. On the, on the opposite side, on the heavy hypermassive case, you have just a, a, a black hole with no collimation at all because there was no time for the magnetic field to, to, to collimate. And very interesting is the light hypermassive case, which is again, uh, uh, is this scenario here that I was describing in the previous transparency here, where you have, uh, after the merger, you have a metastable object, which is the hypermassive neutron star, um, that, keep, uh, that uh, keeps rotating, collimating, the, 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 the magnetic field and creating, as you can see from the color here, uh, uh, the force-free environment around the black hole um, that creates this so-called incipient jet. So since GW170817 presented a short gamma ray burst 1.7 seconds after merger, we, uh, we uh, claimed that uh, the, uh, the masses of the, um, uh, of the remnants should be in this, class, in this category here which means that the 2.75, which was the mass of the whole system, should be larger than uh, the supermassive maximum and smaller than the threshold. In other words, it should be, again, between this range here. And since both of these numbers are related to the maximum spherical limit, one can find that the maximum spherical limit should be less than 2.74 divided by a factor, which is 1.2, 1.3, depending on uh, various arguments. And that gives you a maximum spherical uh, limit of 2.2 to 2.3 again. Now, given the importance of this, uh, uh, conclusion, I want to show you a movie. In this movie, actually, the two neutron stars are going to be spinning. This is another subject that we can talk for an hour, how you, cre you can create spinning binary neutron stars. Suppose that, uh, <laughs> because the formulation to, to do that is by no means trivial, So, but suppose that you have that and you evolve those, uh, those neutron stars. The initial data have been uh, um, uh, have been the, uh, constructed by the Cockal code, and the evolution again is by the Illinois GRMHD code. Um, so the neutron stars, these neutron stars, are, as you can see, has a spin of almost maximal 0.30c. For neutron stars, this is this is a very high spin, and still it is the highest spin to date for such kind of a simulation. Um, uh, here you can see the two arms that are essentially the, uh, with, with purple color. You can see the two arms and the winding of the magnetic field lines. These two arms are significant and the disk is going to be significant due to the high uh, spins of the progenitors. And as, as the uh, hypermassive star here evolves, because of the redistribution of the angular momentum, it collapses into a black hole. Here I'm, I'm, I'm removing the, the field lines in order to see more clearly the hypermassive neutron star. Um, uh, with the disk, of course, that creates around it. Um, and uh, at some point, this is going to uh, collapse to the black hole here. Uh, <clears throat> this is the structure of the disks from the top down view. Uh, you will see soon the magnetic uh, field lines as they exist immediately after merger, which is uh, this this uh, this position here, and then uh, after a little bit of more time, you will see how the magnetic field lines are organizing themselves in this tightly wound funnel, um, uh, and uh, that drive the uh, also the uh, force free parameter to to values of 100 and above. 
Um, uh, here is again a top-down view of the uh, of the black hole. Uh, soon you will see the velocity uh, arrows of the particles uh, around the system. Uh, here is a three, 360 uh, degree view of, of the whole disk with the black hole and the jet. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and th these are the uh, the arrows that are of the, for the outflow. Um, and uh, now you will see a cut through the disk so that you can see the in inner part of the disk around the black hole. Um, this is it, whose dimensional spin is approximately uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So uh, having said that, um, uh, another topic that it is uh, quite interesting these days is, um, uh, is the following. Um, how can one distinguish a binary black hole undergoing merger from a binary neutron star if the individual companions fall inside the so-called mass gap of three to five solar masses? Uh, <clears throat> so, suppose that you. Uh, so, this is something that LIGO and Virgo people are uh, uh, trying to understand and see if they can understand it. Uh, how you can. Um, uh, distinguish between those cases, and I, I will explain a system later on that uh, um, falls into this category. The problem, the first problem, is uh, there is no, there is no one cannot find easily an equation of state that supports three to five solar masses and neutron star. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, that's one thing. The second thing is that because of the large masses of these objects, they will merge very quickly, so you need to put them in very big distances. This is very difficult from the numerical point of view, both from the initial data for the elliptic shoulder and for the hyperbolic shoulder, because he has to resolve these very abrupt fields in very big distances. Uh, <clears throat> uh, at the end of the day, we managed to do both. Uh, first, we constructed an equation of state, uh, which is uh, very stiff. We took our, our favorite equation of state, which was the LF2, and replaced with the inner core with the maximally stiff uh, co and compressible equation of state given by this uh, equation here. Sigma can be taken to be one or one. If you take one third, you have an MIT bank model like a quark core inside uh, the neutron star. And we use the total code to construct this binary neutron star system, which has a total mass of 7.9 solar masses. Um, and every star has a compactness of approximately 0 0.34. Uh, now, let me remind you that the maximum compactness, uh, as, as it was imposed by causality, uh, is around 0 0.35. So this is literally at the limit of, uh, of uh, one, what can have as a causal uh, a neutron star, and uh, uh, until uh, to date, is the most compact binary, non vacuum binary that has been created and evolved. And here I, I show you the um, regular equation of state, the LF2, which is the blue curve, and with the red curve is the modified equation of state, and with the cross is the model that we have picked. So these are the two stars. I'm not going to show you this time a movie. Uh, you have two stars at 80 kilometers. If it was a regular neutron stars, they would have to evolve for 50 orbits or something. But because they are uh, so complex, they only evolve for three orbits and, and then they merge. With essentially zero tidal disruption, as soon as they touch, they immediately, uh, this is as prompt as possible, they immediately collapse the black hole, which you can see here. And here I, can, I, I show you the gravitational wave uh, on the top left um, uh, of the binary black hole case, with, because we evolved the same system with the, with the binary black hole, but that was not difficult to evolve. That's why I'm not mentioning it at all. Uh, the red curve is the binary black hole signal, and the blue and the green curves are the signal from the binary neutral stars with two different resolutions in order to make sure that uh, we are accurate enough. 
And on the top right, on the top right is the very interesting phase difference between the binary black hole and the binary neutron star, and it is significant. It's four others. Although it's small, it can still be measured by LIGO. Uh, <clears throat> and on the on the bottom on the bottom curves, I, I have the spectrum for the strain, uh, as well as the uh, 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 dimensional spin for the remnant black hole as it evolves through time. Um, and now, uh, uh, from the dimensional spin, one can find out, for example, what are the uh, quasi-normal modes and the most dominant one, which is the omega to do here. And we find that we see no difference between one system or another within the accuracy of course of our simulations. So the bottom line of this experiment is that the ring down will be very difficult to be used to distinguish between these two kinds of, uh, of systems, while the in spiral, although it's very small, it's only four radians, it still can be used, at least in principle. Of course, there are uncertainties in the real world of masses, spins, and uh, 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 and other factors that will make this kind of measurement extremely difficult, if not impossible, at least with the current uh, 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 technology. Maybe with the third generation uh, telescope, then maybe that that would be possible. Now, relative to that is the it was the event GW 19014. Uh, which had two masses, one which was very big and it was definitely a black hole, uh, and the other which was slightly larger what, what the estimates that I was telling you, the 2.3 estimate that I was telling you, and there was a debate uh, if it was a black hole or if it's a Newton star. Um, now, preliminary arguments have, see, have shown that uh, by the LIGO group ha that this is too heavy to be a Newton star. Um, uh, of course, if that is a Newton star, what does uh, the question that we wanted to, to address, if that is a Newton star, if we assume that, that the, uh, sec the secondary object was a Newton star, what does that imply for its equation of state and its spin? And I have told you before, and other groups also have done other analysis completely different, that, but they ended up with pre pretty much the same results. That, that was an amazing coincidence that the maximum spherical masses are approximately 2.2 to 2.3 solar masses. And if you add uniform rotation, you get to 2.6, 2.8 solar masses, which means that this object should be rapidly rotating. And the question is, what is the relationship between the spin and the equation of state for this secondary object in case that is a neutron star? And I will show you two scenarios. In the first scenario, we have a soft equation of state where the maximum non-spherical limit is this green, is this black curve here, is somewhere here, and the red curve is the maximum uniformly rotating limit. And this event lies above that, which means that these equations of state cannot um, explain the secondary uh, object if it is a Newton star. Uh, but if we have a stiff, stiffer equation of state where the maximum non-rotating uh, mass is higher, then this band can, you know, can be, uh, get inside between the red and the, and, the, and the black curve, not only get inside, but be close to the black curve, which means it can be even a slowly rotating Newton star. And the bottom line is that a rapid rotation is, uh, may not be sufficient for a soft equation of state and uh, may not be necessary for a stiff equation of state for a neutral star in GW1908-14. <clears throat> um, as, uh, as a fifth piece in this, uh, in this uh, series of uh, problems that I'm trying to represent is the mechanism behind short gamma ray bursts. So, according to the uh, uh, membrane paradigm, as you, uh, as you know, uh, if you have a, a black a spinning black hole with a, a, with a horizon, um, uh, then uh, this is sufficient conditions in order to, cre to create a, a relativistic jet. Now, uh, the, the question is uh, that we wanted to ask is, is it possible to have such kind of a jet or maybe another kind of a jet from a compact object that has an ergorism but not a horizon? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so <laughs> the problem, of course, into trying to address in, uh, this question and, and find out what is the essentially the, the role of the ergorism in the driving of the relativistic jet, 
is that there are no, you typically there are no compact objects who are, that we typically know that have an air collision. Uh, so this led us to a second question, can we find a compact object that has an air collision but not a horizon? Of course, one can go to more crazy or more exotic objects with scalar fields and so on and so on, but we wanted to remain in the realm of the regular neutron stars. And although there were some solutions that were known back to from the end of uh, uh, the 80s, um, those solutions uh, happened to be uh, dynamically unstable. So when you evolve them, they immediately collapse the black hole. So in 19, 2019, for the first time, we found a stable ergo star, uh, which is a differentially rotating neutron star with a specific equation of state, as I'm writing here. Um, and here you can see the neutron star at, at various uh, uh, moments for at, at equal zero after five rotation periods, 10 rotation periods, and 30 rotation periods, uh, just to show, show you the, uh, the, um, the stability of this uh, star. The dynamical time for this is a fraction of the rotation period. So this is uh, stable for many dynamical times with the light green uh, toroidal figure that you can see, it is uh, there is the air collision. Uh, <clears throat> and as you can see, the air collision remains intact pretty much during the evolution. Actually, I will show you a little movie uh, how this star is evolving so that you can appreciate um, uh, the stability of, of the object. This, these stars are differentially rotating, and one characteristic is that they have high densities close to the surface, and that's why uh, you see this uh, probably uniform, uniform coloring uh, of, of, of these pictures that doesn't change. The only th and, and there is this uh, atmosphere around the neutron star as it rotates. So <clears throat> now that we found a stable, finally, ergo star, uh, uh, what happens if we thread it with a magnetic field and do, uh, again, an evolution? And the question is, does it have any difference with a regular star with no air collision? So the first question and the second question, does it have any difference with a black hole with a disk? Uh, well, from a preliminary study that we have done uh, back in 2020, we have, uh, we have seen, so the following, um, the, 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 these pictures here that uh, uh, in the first line I'm showing the uh, the, the evolution of a normal star, on the second line, the evolution of an ergo star, and on the third line, the evolution of the black hole disk. The bottom line is that the ergo region didn't seem to help um, uh, or make a difference uh, with respect to the formation of a jet. Um, so we couldn't find any significant differences between the normal star and the ergo star. Mm, and at the same time, as you can appreciate here from the two figures, um, and at the same time, both of them had significant differences with the black hole disk case, where the force free parameter again could reach very high values to, to 100 and more, uh, while the others were less than 10. <clears throat> Uh, so preliminary, we, although there are a lot of caveats that have to be addressed, we, uh, 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 this preliminary study uh, showed that the ergo region, uh, at least for the specific models that we have tried, didn't give us um, uh, any uh, uh, obvious differences. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now, as a last piece in this uh, 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 series of examples that I want to, to present, is um, again going back to single rotating stars, uh, but for this time, we don't only solve the uh, hydrodynamic and uh, Einstein equations, but on the same time, we solve the Maxwell equations uh, self-consistently together with all, all of the other. So we, uh, for the first time, we computed uh, neutron stars with mixed poloidal and toroidal magnetic fields with extremely high uh, values of, of the of the magnetic fields that reach of 10 to 17 and, and beyond. <clears throat> and on the on the right, I have a normal, on, excuse me, on the left, I have a normal star, um, which is, it has a mass less than the maximum, uh, uh, the, less than the maximum 
of that of the TOV uh, curve. And on the left, I have a super massive star. So uh, we even created extremely rotating uh, stars like that. Uh, one interesting uh, finding that we have seen is that um, as you can, maybe it's difficult to appreciate from the figures, but as you can, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but around the toroidal field, around the toroidal, uh, where the toroidal field becomes maximum here, the density creates a, a kink here. And if you see the density plot, uh, uh, essentially drops to zero inside the neutron star. In this sense, uh, because of the extremely high magnetic field, we have a toroidal coil, which is probably the strongest toroidal coil in the universe. Um, now, uh, these are uh, 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 uniformly rotating stars, and we wanted to evolve them uh, to see how uh, what, what is happening with the stability, the hydrodynamical stability, the magnetic stability, and uh, everything. Uh, so we evolved in, in full GR, and what we found uh, is that, um, uh, first of all, uh, uniform rotation is destroyed and it is, it is replaced by differential rotation. The magnetic field stays, uh, depending on the, I would say, as, a, as I'm writing here, depending on the magnetic field configuration, uh, because we have different uh, um, mixtures of poloidal versus toroidal, um, uh, and that can affect very much the evolution. So it seems that um, uh, some specific mixture is, is more stable than others. The one that I show you was probably the most stable uh, because T over M equals 600 corresponds to more than 10 or 10 time scales. Um, so uh, the magnetic field was uh, pretty much uh, const uh, not constant, stable, but it started showing the, uh, the, uh, all these instabilities um, that are known from perturbation theory. Um, uh, and of course, uh, uh, the uniform rotation has been destroyed, and we, this time also exhibited large oscillations of the density, which are approximately 10 to, uh, 10 to 40 percent of the initial maximum central density. <clears throat> Uh, so, so this is a first work, and uh, it seems that there is a, a lot of work to be done in this field, and we plan to, to continue it. Um, so uh, some final thoughts because, before I close this, uh, this talk is that with numerical relativity, one can, have, can make concrete numerical predictions for things that uh, uh, right now are uh, inter interested for, for a lot of uh, people, the light of Virgo and so on and so on, it can test the Einstein's theory in the full non-linear regime in the most extreme conditions. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, although, as I'm saying on the second bullet point here, uh, we, a lot of things, we have understood a lot of things, still we are lacking a unified picture. In particular, for example, um, uh, what is happening, uh, this is a totally incomplete list, and I just uh, point to three uh, arbitrary uh, subjects here. Uh, what are the processes that are leading to a neutral relativistic jet? What are the roles of the turbulence and the stabilities and the creation of the magnetic field? Uh, the roles of the neutrinos, the stability of the single rotating neutral star with magnetic fields, the consistent uh, um, uh, formulations of all this, and so on and so on. Uh, now, in the past, we have great progress by doing some crude solutions, but it, it seems that I don't know if that will continue for the future. And maybe in order to advance, we will need faster codes, um, more accurate numerical methods, and, and, and better uh, mathematical formulations. And now, the reason that I'm saying that is that as I'm writing in the last bullet, uh, <clears throat> As we include more physics and uh, make our mathematical formulations more um, accurate and complete, uh, this puts multiple strains on the computational resources and even the, the codes essentially that we have developed um, and makes uh, uh, the, whole, uh, um, uh, the whole solution to be not viable because if you have to wait for a month to get a solution or you have to wait for a year to get a solution, then you cannot understand the, the system. You, you will get one solution, but at the end of the day, you won't be able to understand the system. So unless we improve in all fronts, both the theoretical, the computational, and the mathematical, we, 
we may lose or at least delay important advances in astrophysics. So um, that's it. I want to end it here. And I'm happy to take any questions or comments or anything. Thank you, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, there will be talks first from the audience here, and then if there is someone from the participants, yes, please. Uh, thank you very much. Well, this is very, very impressive. Uh, I have a comment and a question. Uh, you don't need a, a horizon or an ecosphere to have a jet. We have jets in the uh, is, is, is it possible uh, uh, for, for the person to uh, yes, speak yes. louder because I, I yeah, don't hear. Can you, can you He's hear just approaching. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear? Okay. It's okay now? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Okay, thank you for your talk. Everything was very impressive. Uh, regarding the jets, a, a comment. Uh, we have jets from stellar objects and from this. We don't need, uh, what, I'm, what I mean is, we don't need horizons or ergospheres to have a jet, and this is known. So, uh, your. Uh, solution of a neutron star with an ergosphere and no horizon is interesting, but it doesn't have to do with the existence or non-existence of jets. Uh, my question is, your simulation where you have jets, do you have an atmosphere? So are, are these vacuum or force or MHD simulations? That, that, that's a good point. Uh, before I answer that, I agree with uh, uh, what you have said in the first place. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm mostly, maybe I didn't mention it, I was referring uh, to various studies with uh, people like, for example, Komisarov, uh, uh, that they were saying that uh, uh, the driving force is the ergosphere, for example, and not the horizon. Uh, this is settled. It's not, it's not the ergosphere of the horizon. It, it's anything that, that, that spins, it is a driving force. It, it's not the horizon or the atmosphere, I think. But, but I mean, from a self-consistent, uh, okay, we can, we can, uh, I, I, I can, I can, uh, you know, I can accept that. Regarding your question, it's very, uh, um, uh, very crucial. And that's one thing that we want to improve in the future. Yes, we have a big atmosphere. Um, uh, so our simulations are uh, MHD simulations. So, so ideal MHD simulations. So ideally, we want to have a force-free environment outside in order to to, uh, to to do this kind of thing and inside to have an MHD. So we can either use um, some code that has outside force free and inside MHD, or we can use some kind of a resistive code that, the, for example, the, the actually another Greek colleague, Kiki Dionisopoulou, has, has been uh, developed some time ago, uh, and others, uh, Palenzuela, and so on and so on. So, yes, we have an atmosphere, and that is one of the caveats in our simulations. A, a, a comment on, on that is, uh, and, and the question is, what really supports the jet? What collimates the jet? My feeling is it, it is collimated by the atmosphere. Uh, and nevertheless, you show this picture like Valenzuela shows that you have the magnetic field and it seems like the, the jet appears out of nowhere. My feeling, I may be wrong on that, is that the jet, this funnel there is supported by the atmosphere, which you do not actually show. But I, I, I don't think, if you had everything in vacuum, you wouldn't have such a jet. That's my feeling, and I may be wrong on that. And I have a question, is what is the resolution of your simulations? And I'm asking that because we know that there are uh, there is this so-called MRI stability that- That's right. Uh, we, 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 resolve, we resolve the MRI, and if you see in, uh, in our pictures, we are plotting a lot of times, uh, well, not in all of the papers that we are publishing, but in a, in a couple of them, we are plotting the quality factors that resolve the MRI by a significant number. But of course, we don't use the resolution that Palizuela have recently used, which is like 30 meters over the one that QG uh, has used 10 years ago. Yes, which which I, I, I was thinking more about the Japanese group. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that was a crazy simulation. Uh, no, we... your, your comment, how important is that in, uh, for the final result? 
we are not experts here, but if you increase, it, let's it, say, it, it is not important. It is it not is important. Not important. Okay. It is not, it is <laughs> not important. The, 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 the reason that they use high resolution is in order to capture the instability. So when the neutron stars uh, merge, there is one instability that is happening in the in the layer of the when yes, it's exactly, smart, exactly. which is the Kelvin Helmholtz instability, and then it is the MRI. And the neutron stars, starting from a magnetic field of 10 to the 13 Gauss, they can, uh, within uh, a very reasonable small amount of time, they can be um, uh, exponentially uh, increased to 10 to the 16 and locally 10 to the 17 Gauss. That's the only reason that the that you know this um, it doesn't have to do with the jet. Actually, the Shibata group couldn't find the jet long time ago, and even the the group by Frankfurt, um, uh, although they they claimed that they had the jet, they, in reality they didn't have a jet. So that is, that was not uh, the resolution was not the factor. The, <clears throat> Uh, we use high magnetic fields or that start of 10 to the 14th Gauss in order to mimic this kind of, uh, uh, of growth because we cannot use this extreme resolution. Um, uh, regarding the previous comment uh, that it's coming from the atmosphere, uh, apparently it's not. Uh, although we, uh, by no means I have the final answer to that question. Uh, because if it was coming from the atmosphere, uh, uh, I don't know what exactly the atmosphere you meant, but if you meant the atmosphere of the neutron star, that is not the case. Because when we, when we have a remnant, which is not, as I showed in the, in the left column, which is a neutron star and not a black hole, then we don't see the so-called incipient jet that we are talking about. Thank you. So, so the jet comes only when you have a black hole. And the reason that we have seen, at least in our simulations, is because only when you have a black hole with the horizon, you, you can see the force free parameter to reach values of 100 and above and create this, uh, uh, essentially clear the, the poles from the baryon load environment and have the, uh, have the jet. And that's why we, you know, we have done all these um, projects that, <laughs> that you know i was talking about yeah okay yeah. this result is if true it is very very interesting and we can spend the time uh, you know hours discussing it and let's not continue the discussion but uh, but if it, if it's true it's very interesting in the sense that if you have one star alone it doesn't like a, 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 i'm talking about the pulsar for example with a magnetic field it will not produce a jet it will just fill all all area and yet now you have something that produces a jet. That is very, very interesting, if true. Yeah, uh, I think there is a global, as a final comment in that, uh, there is a, a worldwide um, agreement that when the neutron stars, the, let's say in the binary neutron stars, they have low mass, so you end up with a supermassive neutron star at the end and not with a black hole, then you won't have a jet. Uh, and these are uh, simulations that have been done by Tiolfi. I can point you that he, uh, uh, our simulations, by the way, have gone up to 200 milliseconds. He has done uh, over to half, half a second or maybe a second. I don't remember exactly the number. He has gone even longer and, and he has seen that there is no way you can have a jet. So although, again, <laughs> nothing is uh, written in stone yet, but uh, that's the current understanding. Okay, and to, to, to stop the questions, I, I still disagree that you have a jet, but as I said, we can discuss it uh, some other time. But uh, very, your, this result is very, very impressive. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, let me say that uh, the person asking was Yanis Kontopoulos. Oh. Uh, we thank the, for the vivid discussion. Let me check. I don't see anyone else from the audience uh, from the, uh, to, to want to uh, ask something more, but let's check if there is somebody else. No, I don't see anyone uh, else who would like to ask a question. So then, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, okay, so.